Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Verse 7. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and he does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Therefore there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, He has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Let's pray. Father, as we look at your holy word and we learn about your son Jesus, the good shepherd. Lord, we do would not want to be distracted. We want to be focused and hear what you have to say. From, uh, to us, Lord, and the words that I speak, we want them to come directly from you when we believe they are, Lord. I'm studied up for it. We've been praying about it. And Lord, we want to hear you tell us about your son, the Good Shepherd. So bless our time in your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, you guys can have a seat. I entitled this The Good Shepherd, but you know what? As I was reading it, I would have probably called it the perfect shepherd, or the amazing shepherd, or the loving shepherd, or the complete shepherd. But he calls himself the good shepherd, so we're going to call it the good shepherd. But I have three points I want to make. One is the true shepherd, from verse 1 through 6. This is the true shepherd. Number two, it's the personal shepherd. This is verse 7 to 10, the personal shepherd. The third point is the protective shepherd. This is verse 11 to 21, the protective shepherd. We have the true shepherd, the personal shepherd, and the protective shepherd. And you know, shepherd or people are compared to sheep in the Bible. It's kind of a funny thing, you know. You're not he doesn't compare us to a cheetah, the fastest animal in the in the forest, or the lion, the strongest in the forest, or the gorilla, or a, an eagle. He calls us a sheep. Sheep, that's not a compliment. Sheep are kind of dumb, they're kind of stupid, they tend to do their own thing, they can be led astray. And you heard the old jokes about you know, one sheep goes off for the off a cliff, and the other one goes, and even if sheep say it's a bad idea, they just keep going and just keep going. I didn't make that joke. I've been using it for years. But you know what? In the hymn, uh, the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, the author picks up on this when he says, Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger brought, bought me with his precious blood. And he goes on to say, let your goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart from, uh, from thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. So we're going to look at the true shepherd here, the true shepherd. You know, in verse 1, it, it's amazing. It talks about if someone comes and enters in by another way, you know, that's what thieves and robbers do. They come in by another way. You know, that's... That's how thieves are. Thieves and robbers use windows, the cloak of darkness. They don't come into your front door. But you know what? This is what false teachers and cults do. Notice how it says, if anyone climbs up by some other way, cults and false teachers will have another way to get right with God. Or they'll have another religious book. 
to go along with the Bible. Or they'll have another version of the Bible, their own version, but they won't go with the truth. But verse 3 says, the doorkeeper, which is symbolic of the Holy Spirit, he, re he hears the sheep voice of the sheep and he calls, or he opens the door. The, I'm sorry, I've got this all wrong. The doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. The doorkeeper is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told us about the Holy Spirit in John 16, 13. He says, he is the spirit of truth and he will guide you in all truth. And then in John 15, 26 of the Holy Spirit, he says, he will testify of me. And that's what the Holy Spirit will do. He'll testify to you if that spirit, if that voice is of the Lord or not. He will give us a check, if you will. And it says, and the sheep hear his voice. So how do we hear his voice? Well, primarily through his word. He's given us his word, the Bible. Sometimes in our prayer time, he will put a, an impression in our mind, or even throughout the day, we'll get some thoughts in our mind, or sometimes he can speak through people, he can speak through circumstances, but how do we know if all of these are his voice or not? Well, the word of God. The word of God is what we go by. That's why we call it Impact Bible Fellowship. Jesus said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they that testify with me. He says, these are the scriptures that testify of me. And then he says, if anyone wants to do God's will, he will know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He will, he will show you in the word if that voice is from him or not. If it lines up, great. If it doesn't, it's not of the Lord and we need to reject it. Do you hear God's voice regularly? Are you spending time daily with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Do you have a prayer time with him? Notice how it says, he calls his own sheep by name. I love that. Are you his sheep? You can be. Oh, well, I've always been the black sheep of the family. Yeah, well, that can change. You know, God is just a prayer away. I love how Jesus says in, in John 6, 37, All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. In other words, he says, I will not turn away. I will not reject anybody who comes to me. I don't care what you've done. You can come to me. Don't let the enemy of the world rip you off. Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28, 30, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. He says, Take my yoke upon you, and me, uh, upon you and learn of my ways, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. He's saying, Don't take on all the pressures of life on yourself. Come to me, listen to me, and you will have rest for your souls. Then he says, By name. He knows my name. I think Greg's going to sing that song with the worship team when we're done. He knows my name. He knows your name. I don't care who you are. He knows your name. And notice it says, he leads them out. He leads them out. We just had uh, Brother Matt read uh, Psalm 23. The, 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 it talks about David calling to the good shepherd, recognizing that God is his good shepherd. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. I don't know if you picked that up, but he leads me in and he leads me out. What I mean by that, he leads me in to a place of rest, a place of refuge, a place where he wants to minister to us. He, want, he leads us into that place where we can pray and seek his face and in his word. And then it says he restores our soul and then he leads us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. He leads us out. He leads us in to minister to us and to equip us, and then he leads us out. And then in verse 4, it says, he goes before them. This is a common theme in the scriptures, he goes before them. When the children of Israel were getting ready to leave Egypt in Exodus 13, 21, it says, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. They had this own personal GPS system. You know, they had a cloud by day and fire by night. And when it moved, they moved. And when it stayed, they stayed. And they were guaranteed to be in the presence of the Lord. Well, the same thing was spoken to Joshua. And he was going to lead them physically into the promised land. Joshua 31.8. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear, nor be dismayed. But then I like how it says they know his voice. They know his voice. I don't know if you heard about this, but over Easter, there was a Georgia senator, Reverend Raphael Warnock. He is a proclaimed reverend. He was just elected, and there's a lot of 
things about him that I've heard that aren't good, but he, he tweeted this on Resurrection Sunday. The meaning of Easter is more transcendent, transcendent than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Whether you are a Christian or not, through a commitment to help others, we are able to save ourselves. Ouch! I heard a bunch of groans in the audience. You know why? Because you know your Bible. And if you know your Bible, you're going to hear that and you're going to reject it. And that is not the voice of God. I don't care if you call yourself a reverend or a pastor. That's why we need to know the word of God. Because you know that that statement is blasphemy. Then in verse 5 it says, Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him. They do not know the voice of strangers. Loyal, trusting sheep will know the shepherd's voice. And they will not follow an, an alien voice. Because you know what it says about the devil in um, 2 Corinthians 11, 13, and 15. It talks about how Satan and his deceitful workers will transform themselves into angels of light, ministers of righteousness. That's how cults and false teachers come. They have a, 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 an assembly or a kind of a somewhat of godliness in them. They use Christianese, if you will. They say a lot of things, but they are from the enemy. That's why we know our Bible to discern that. But that's also why we have a personal shepherd. I love this section, the personal shepherd. In verse 7, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Verse 9, I am the door. Notice he says, I am the door. I am not a door. There's only one door. There's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. Because he's the only one that was a son of God that died for our sins and rose again from the dead. In John 15, 1, he says, I am the true vine, meaning there's other vines, there's other things that promise life, but only Jesus is the one that does that. In fact, Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. And in verse 8, we read, all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. True, true sheep spend much time in the good shepherd's pasture. Look in verse 9. They spend much time in the good shepherd's pasture. Verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. I like that. They will go in and out and find pasture. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Jesus said in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens a door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. You see, Jesus, our good shepherd, he loves the sheep. He loves the church. He said in Luke 12, 32, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The Lord loves to give the kingdom of heaven to his children, to his sheep. And it says they will go in and out and find pasture. Notice, this is not a one-time deal. Okay, you enter in, you're saved, you'll see in heaven, bye. It's no, they go in and out, in and out, and they find pasture. What do they do when they go in and out? First of all, they see the shepherd. They see the shepherd. They spend time with the shepherd. They feed there. They get daily nutrition and they get sustenance of what they need to live the spiritual life, the Christian life. They go there to rest. They go there to rest to get recharged up. They go there for protection. They're protected by the shepherd. My question is, do you, do I, do we have a place that we regularly go to have that time with the Lord? I love how Jesus said in Matthew 6, 6, he says, but when you pray, not if you pray, he said, but when you pray, go into your room and shut your door and pray to your father who's in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. That's what he's talking about. These sheep go in and out and they find pasture. And you know what? They are healthy sheep because they spend that time with them. And then in verse 10, we have what I think is the greatest definition of the spiritual battle in the Christian life. Two opposing sides, good and evil. One is the Lord and one is the devil. Two choices of, of who to listen to or obey. We can listen to the voice of the Lord or we can listen to the voice of the enemy. He says in, chapter, in verse 10, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come, Jesus says, that you would have life and that you would have it more abundantly. First he comes as the thief. The number one thing the devil wants to steal from every human being is the opportunity to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior and to go to heaven. That's the number one thing he tries to do in every human's life. Now, once someone accepts Christ, he switches gears. He switches his strategy. Now his number one goal in that person's life is to rip them off of their Christian experience, to deceive you, 
to keep you from not experiencing the abundant life. And he has all kinds of tricks to get you busy in other things and on whatever, believing other things, uh, to try to rip you off from the abundant life that God has planned for you. The thief or the devil doesn't only come to steal, he comes to kill. Now, we read earlier that Jesus had called out these religious leaders and said, you guys are of your father, the devil. He goes, he was a liar and a murderer. And that's what the devil is all about. He is about killing. One of the things that he does is inspire murder in a lot of different ways. One is, is abortion. Abortion is, sadly, it's a killing of unborn children. And even up until the ninth month, they're, a lot of these political leaders, that's what they're behind. Is they're, they're not, they don't have a problem with that. But when, when the Lord talks about the seven things the Lord hates, one of them is hands that shed innocent blood. That's the most innocent blood. They have no choice in it. You know, but their mothers chose to chose life. Why can't they choose life? Another thing is hatred. The enemy inspires hatred. Jesus told us if we have anger or hatred in our heart, it is like murder. Ouch. That's in Matthew 5, 21 to 26. Jesus as us as a believer sets us to a higher standard. Don't have hatred or anger in your heart for someone. Another thing the enemy uses racism. Racism is manufactured hatred towards people that are different. Let me say that again. It's manufactured hatred towards people that are different. You can get two little kids, doesn't matter what color they are, what race they are, they'll play all day long. The only time they'll stop is when they start hearing something from their parents or somebody else. And as they grow up and they start hearing voices, racism is developed. That's not God's plan. That's from the enemy. Envy, envy and covetousness. This is when you want something that somebody else has and you want it so bad you're actually even willing to kill for it and people do this in our in our world which is sad another way to kill is slander and gossip slander and gossip is when you assassinate someone else's character and they don't have the opportunity to defend themselves that's what gossip and slander is. that's why when we do marriage counseling we will meet with a couple i won't meet with the guy and or the girl, or my wife won't meet with the girl, we meet with the couple, so they can both have both sides of the story, so there is no gossip going on or slander. Then to destroy, he comes to steal, he comes to kill, he comes to destroy. You know what he wants to destroy? He wants to destroy your relationships. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy all these relationships you have with friends because the devil hates family, he hates unity, and he hates peace. And he also wants to destroy the joy that you have. He wants to destroy your witness and your character. Anything you're positive or good that you do that would help benefit others, the devil would try to destroy. But what we need to do is we need to come to Jesus. Jesus says, I have come that you would have life and that more abundantly. Life is eternal and everlasting. Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. But the thing about everlasting is it's everlasting. We always think of everlasting eternal life as like, okay, when I die, I'm going to heaven. That's eternal life. That's everlasting life. Eternal life and everlasting life starts right now. We are in the middle of everlasting and eternal life. That's why he says, I have come that you would have life and that you would have it more abundantly. The abundant life is the, the satisfying, full life, rich, full of meaning and purpose of life that God wants us to have as we get to know him and as we serve him. I love how Jesus put it in Matthew 10, 39. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus did many parables, parables on people giving their lives to pleasure and riches and chasing things that are not helpful for us, that the world or the devil or the enemy promises is going to bring us happiness and joy. And Jesus says, you can chase those all you want and you are going to lose your life. I mean, you literally, if you follow that road, you're going to lose your life eternally. But he says, if you live for me and you lose your life for my sake, you're going to find it. And you're going to find out what you were created for. We were created to know God, and we were created to do good, and we were created to be a blessing to other people. And when we get it, we understand why God created us. The Bible says God puts eternity in the hearts of men. We, we, we have a homing device for heaven. We were made to know the Lord. And then we have the third point, which is the protective shepherd. In verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But I love how he goes on in, in verse 15, I lay down my life for the sheep. In verse 17, I lay down my life. In verse 18, no one takes it, but I lay it down and I may take it up. Greater love has no one than this than to lay one down, down one's life for his friends. Jesus said in John 15, 13, 
You want to see how much God loves you? Take a look at the cross. Take a look at the cross. This is what it says about it in, in Romans 5, 8. When we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Did you catch that? He died for the ungodly. He didn't die for the righteous. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I said this before. He didn't die for us when we were all cleaned up in goody two shoes and turning from our sin. He, di he died for us when we were in our sin. Isn't that great? And then he turns things around. Awesome. And then in verse 12 and 13, we see this interesting character come up, the hireling. And we read that the hireling is, uh, he is not the shepherd. He doesn't own the sheep. He sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters him. Why does he flee? Look at verse 13. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. He flees because he doesn't care. You know, the Bible says that the Lord will never leave us or forsake us. Now, pastors are considered shepherds and leaders are considered shepherds, but it doesn't say that the pastors and the shepherds will never leave us or forsake us. It says the Lord will never leave us or forsake us. Did you know that? We, a, a good shepherd should point us to the or a, a good pastor shepherd should point us to the real shepherd, Jesus. That's what I'm trying to say. Our ultimate hope is in him. John the Baptist in John chapter 1, when Jesus came to be baptized, John the Baptist said to his disciples, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And they left and they followed Jesus. And he said, Good. That's what you were made for. You weren't made to follow me. You were made to follow him. And that's what pastors and leaders and teachers are supposed to educate us in, that we look to the Lord. We don't look to people. Yes, those in positions of authority and whatnot, Christians, all Christians, are to have a good example and to be a good testimony. But we ultimately, we look to Jesus, the real shepherd. And notice, we see no reference to the sheep fighting off the wolves. Only the good shepherd fights off the wolf. Think about that. That's the key to spiritual warfare. In, John, in James 4, 7, it says, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. A lot of people say, Oh, resist the devil, resist the devil. James says, Submit to God, resist the devil, and then he will flee. We need God's help. We can't do it ourselves. Now, note the different names in these first handful of passages for those who do not look out for or care for the sheep. We have the thief, we have robbers, we have strangers, we have the wolf, and we have the hireling. We have all these different five designations of, of um, peoples or creatures that uh, take advantage of this, this sheep. The first one is a thief, one who steals by stealth. You don't realize you rip, ripped off until later. That's what a thief does. He comes like when you're not around, and he takes it, and then later you see that. And that's what false teachers and, and other deceivers do. They're speaking things to you. You think you're truth, and you don't realize later, man, I've been ripped off. These guys have been lying to me. Now, a robber, on the other hand, he still steals. But this is what he does. He steals by force. He doesn't hide what he's trying to take from you. I'll be honest with you. This is what you see a lot in our country now. Many politicians were, some of them were like thieves. They would do something, and you would know about it. they they pass a bill, but in the bill, there'd be something evil. You would know about it later. Nowadays, they just come out, and this is what we're doing, and we don't care what you guys think. This is what we're doing. That's the difference between a thief and a robber, but these type of people can be in our lives if we don't watch out. And then there's a stranger. A stranger is like maybe somebody new or somebody that just comes out of the blue and they pretend to know you and they pretend to care about you, but they don't. There's a reason your parents have always told you, don't talk to strangers. You gotta know the person before you let them talk to your kids, right? And that's what Jesus is saying. There are strangers that come. They'll try and pull you out of the flock. Then there's the wolf, the wolf. His only goal is to kill. It's amazing, though. You know what Jesus said about false teachers? He says they're ravenous wolves in sheep's clothing. They look like sheep. They sound nice, but they are bad to the bone because they are a, they are a ravenous wolf. They want to kill. They want to destroy you. You ever remember that story, the three little pigs? got these three little pigs they're sent out by mom mom to say let's go find yourself live live your life do whatever you'll, you'll use whatever the first little that little sheep says i'm going to build a house of straw because it's going to be fast and i'm just going to sit back and i'm going to enjoy life next thing you know the good wolf the wolf comes starts knocking at the door says he's going to come in and oh knock by the hair of my chin 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 says i'll huff and puff and i'll blow your house down and he does blows the house down and guess what 
He has a leg of lamb. He, he, I say that's the wrong, wrong animal. He had, he had bacon. That's why. Okay. Wrong story. I told you, you got to pray for me. Second sheep says, you know what? I saw what happened to my brother or sister who's no longer with us. I'm going to build my little fortress or my little house out of sticks. It's going to be a little bit more sturdy. But I'm not going to go all in because I'm going to enjoy life too. Hello? Next thing you know, the wolf comes, knocks on the door. I'm going to eat you up. And he goes, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. So the wolf, the wolf uh, what is it, huffs and puffs and he blows the house down. He goes in and this time he has pork loins. He eats the little pig. The third pig is a little smarter. He says, you know what? I'm going to build a brick house. I thought I was going to say something. The inside voice is a lot worse than the outside voice. I'm just saying. So anyways, he builds it from brick. And the wolf comes and huffs and puffs and tries to blow his house down. And he just runs out of air. And he is protected. The, the pig is protected from the wolf. And you know what that, that reminded me of? It reminds me of what the Lord told us in Matthew at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. In chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. The greatest sermon ever told. Jesus said, a wise man is like a man who built his house on the rock. And when the storms of life came, it stood and it was strong because it was built on the rock. Those are those who hear my teachings and do them. Now, he said the fool, those are the ones that they, they hear my teachings, but they don't do them. And they're like a fool who built his house on the sand. And when the storms of life come and the rains and the floods, it gets mowed over and it's destroyed. That was just like the pigs. Because that's the only way we can defend ourselves against the wolf, the wolves, if you will, by being in his word and allowing him to protect us. The last one is the hireling. Hireling is basically a person who works for pay often. But often it is understood that they have little or no concern for the value of the work and they will do anything out of the goodness of their heart, especially if it's inconvenient, as we saw in this story. Okay, I'll wash the sheep, the sheep, but as soon as the wolf comes, I'm out of here. You know, Jesus is a good shepherd, the only one who can give you 100% protection. And on our Tuesday night Bible fellow, Tuesday night um, prayer meeting, we're going through the armor of God. And this week, we're going to cover this verse, which talks kind of a lot about what we've been talking about. Ephesians six twelve. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. See, we think we have problems with people and circumstances and things, and the Bible is telling us that there's a devil that's behind that, and there's demonic forces that are behind that. And when we learn of the armor of God, he shows us how to defend that, how we can have victory, and we're going to learn that. And look at verse 14. Verse 14 says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I'm known by my sheep. I love that. I know my sheep, and I'm known by my sheep. Look at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And then look at verse 3. It talks about how he calls his own sheep by name. And I want to finish this up. Uh, I want you, everybody to turn to Psalm 139. As I was praying over this study this week, the Lord just told me about Psalm 39. And what's great about Psalm 39, it tells us what God knows about us. 139, I'm sorry. Psalm 139. This is a psalm by King David, a man for God's own heart. And he tells us how God knows everything about us and how he cares about us. And in Psalm 139.1, he says, Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. I love it. He says, you've searched me and you've known me. Past tense. Not like he's searching and trying to figure out. He's already searched you. He already knows about you. He already knows everything about you. And he says, you know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. He understands our thoughts. He understands why some of us are thinking things that maybe aren't true or maybe aren't helpful. He knows that some of us have gone through some very challenging times and we're questioning things. He understands why we're thinking that. And he wants us to give us his truth. He wants us to know that everything that happens in your life, I'm fully aware of and I'm using it for my purposes. He says, you comprehend my path and my lying down. In verse 2, it was my sitting down and my rising up. In verse 3, it's my lying down. Every time of the day, he knows what you're doing. He knows what's going on. And he says, you comprehend my path. He knows the paths that we take. He knows why you live in Riverside. He knows about why you married that person, why you took that career field. He knows everything. But then he says, 
and you are acquainted with all my ways. He knows everything about us. That's amazing. Verse 4, there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, Lord, you know it all together. He knows every word we speak. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's not a good word. But he knows that. He knows that with love. In verse 5, you have hedged me behind and before, and you have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. You have hedged me. Remember hedges? Hedges are that phrase that we read about in Job. When, the, when Satan said to the, to the Lord, you put a hedge around Job. In other words, you protected him. God has put a hedge of protection around us. He only allows things to go so far in our life. But then he says, and you've laid your hand upon me. Laid your hand upon me is a phrase used in the Bible of God's hand and direction and blessing and ownership on you. In Ezra, when Ezra, there was a, a handful of times, almost, almost six different times in the book of Ezra, where it says, the hand of the Lord was upon Ezra. The hand of the Lord was upon Ezra and his people. And the king says, the hand of your God is upon you. When Jabez made that great prayer, the Jabez prayer you read about in 1 Chronicles uh, 4.10, he has this bold prayer. Lord, I pray that you bless me, that you would expand my territory, that your hand would be with me. He wanted God's hand on him. He wanted God's blessing on him. And David is saying, you have laid your hand upon me. And then he says, such knowledge is too wonderful. It is high. I cannot attain. He, he is like his mind is blown how much God thinks about him, how much God loves about him, how much God cares about him, how much God's got everything handled and controlled. He's just like, I just cannot believe it. But then he goes on from there and he says in verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Answer, nowhere. But then he goes on to say, if I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. He's saying no matter how many highs you have in your life and how many lows, I'm there. No matter where you go, no matter what happens, I am there. You cannot escape me because I love you. My hand is upon you. I remember years ago, I, uh, I went out in the forest for like four or five days. I was basically running from God. I, I thought I was going to go hunting. I had a bow. I went up in the mountains, took my truck up there. What I had was a divine appointment to the Lord. I was escaping God, and God was reminding me, you cannot run from your responsibilities. I love you. I have a plan for you. You need to follow me. I tried to go. I tried to flee, but the Spirit was there to direct me back. And that's what I love. He says, even there, your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. Then he goes on to say in verse 11, If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from light, but the light, the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. See, Jesus is the light of the world. Nothing can escape his light. No darkness can escape his light. You may be in the darkest pit of your, of your life, but God's light can reach you. He sees it, and he wants to help you, and he holds out his hand. He wants to help you. Everything is, is, is perfect light to God. He sees everything we do. He sees, hears our thoughts, he, our, our words, and he knows our thoughts. Don't hide from God. He is light of the light. Then he goes back to the beginning in verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. He's talking about in the womb, you created me. It's, it says you are you covered me. It's like you sewed me together. You stitched me together. You made me in the womb. And then he says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I love how Psalm 33, 15 and Job 10, 8 say that God makes us individually. We're not like made on an assembly line, you know, like we're all the same. Every single person has a unique personality and an existence that he knows about. He has created everybody for his glory and his purposes. Everyone. He has an intricate design for them. In fact, this same passage is given to us over in Jeremiah. When Jeremiah was a young man, he was called by the Lord and he was struggling with the call. He didn't think he was worthy. He didn't think he deserved it. And in Jeremiah 1, he says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And I ordained you. I called you to be a prophet. 
He says, I knew who you were and I knew what you were going to be for before I even created. And David says, I will praise you. I am fearfully and wonderful made. Marvelous are your works. Then he goes in verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance yet being unformed. He says, I saw you even before you were unformed. I, knew, I saw you in my mind. I already knew what I had planned for you. And then he says, the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. He knew the days that you and I were going to live on this earth. He knew the days, what was going to happen. He knows what's going to happen. But wait, there's more. Verse 17, how precious also are your thoughts for me or to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. He never stops thinking about us. I mean, it's hard to believe, but you know what? That's what makes God God. He's not human. He's God. He can think of all of us, but he thinks of us individually. Notice how he says, how precious are your thoughts to me. Sometimes we think, okay, his thoughts to me can't be too good because I haven't done too good or my life hasn't gone that good or you know my mistakes. Check this out. One of my favorite verses, many of you guys know it, is in uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, where God says, I know the thoughts that I think for, for you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and hope. God's plan is to give us peace, to give us a future, and to give us a hope. That promise was made to the children of Israel when they were coming out of Babylon. In Babylon, the children of Israel, because of their disobedience, have been taken into captivity. Then God called them back out. Guess what? Some of them stayed. Some, hey, we're happy, we're good, we're doing fine in Babylon, we don't want to go. They were happy with the world, but the ones that came out, that turned from their old lifestyle and came to follow the Lord, the Lord said, my thoughts towards you are peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. And that's what God says to us. And then he says, when I awake, I am still with you. Another reminder of God's presence doesn't leave his people. When you wake up, boom, God's right there every day. Now, this next section is really interesting. It's kind of like God has shown David so much. David loves the Lord so much. And he knows how good he is that all of a sudden he has a hatred for those that hate God. And he says in verse 19, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Wow. David loved God so much, man. He just, he just was furious against people that hated God. That is why God chose David to take on Goliath. Notice what it says in verse 20. They speak wickedly against you. Your enemies take your name in vain. And when David took on Goliath, Goliath was chastising God's people and belittling them and says, you, you know, just cursing him. And then David says, no one's going to do anything. I'll go. And God gave him that strength to do that. And God can give us strength to do anything. But then when he finishes this psalm, he gets to a point where all of us as believers should be, especially of those of us that love God. He checks his heart. He's not assuming that he's perfect or he's everything God wants him to be. He always wants God to be working in his life. And he says in verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This is the guy that's doing great. He's the king of Israel. He's the man for God's own heart. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me and know my anxieties. He's saying, Lord, there's things in my life that are anxious about, that are causing concern. I need you to check my heart. Are these honest concerns, or are they concerns that are evil and are not pleasing to you? And he says, and if there's a wicked way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. That's a great prayer to have. Lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, search my heart. You know my heart. You know, that's where God wants us to be. He wants us to be looking to him. He wants us to know that we're uh, his sheep and he is our good shepherd. And my prayer is that we might even take this passage, Psalm 139, and even Psalm 23, and this portion of John 10, and just go and read about it. Read about the good shepherd and his love for us. How he is everything we need. He is the true shepherd. He is a personal shepherd. He is a protective shepherd. He is the good shepherd. 
Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, as we have just got done reading about your love for us, we are just sheep in need of our good shepherd, Lord. There may be some of us that they're just not, they haven't got to that point. They have not given their hearts to you, Lord. And Lord, all they need to do is make a simple prayer of, Lord, forgive me a sinner. I'm tired of my life. I want to follow you, Jesus. I believe that you are the resurrection and life, that if I believe in you, I will not die. I will be raised again in new life. And I want to turn from my sin. And I want to accept you as my Lord and Savior. If that's your, your desire, that's all you have to do. I'm just going to say a prayer and you can repeat it in your heart. Lord, forgive me. I know I've sinned. I know I've made mistakes in my life. But Lord, I am tired of doing this on my own. I am tired of the thieves and the robbers and the strangers and the wolves and the hirelings that say they care about me that don't, Lord. I believe that you are the good shepherd and only you care about me and I want to follow you. I just turn from all of my garbage, all of my stuff, all of my junk, Lord, and I just come to you with open arms. Take me as your own, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen.